Good morning. My name is Justin Beatty, and I'm one of the pastors here at People's United Methodist Church in Oregon, Wisconsin. And I'd like to welcome you this morning to the streaming premiere of our worship service. I'd also like to remind you that if there is something in this service that is meaningful to you, then I would invite you to put it in the comments down below. Um, I do have one quick bit, one quick piece of business to start out with. Um, we are having some trouble with the service that we use to send out all of our church emails. Um, they're not getting through to everyone. Uh, and for some people, they're getting through, but they're being put in junk mail folders, so they're not getting seen. Uh, so you should be getting emails from us about what's going on in the church every Wednesday, and then also uh, every Sunday morning with the, the link to this service. And if you've stopped receiving those emails in a couple week, within the last couple of weeks, could you please um, send a message to office at peoplesumc.org and let us know. Hopefully that will help us to rectify this problem sooner rather than later. Um, or alternatively, if this is your first time joining us, first of all, welcome. And secondly, if you would like to be put on our church's email list, then you can, re what you can request to be added at office at peoplesumc.org. Uh, now today we are continuing with our Lenten sermon series again and again. And hopefully the idea that comes through within this series is that even though bad things happen, even though again and again we see the brokenness in the world, in the midst of our despair, God comes to us again and again. God offers us the sacred refrain, I choose you, I love you, I will lead you to repair. Again and again, God breaks the cycle and offers us a new way forward. Even though much is unclear right now, if as we come together to worship God, even though we have to do so while physically apart, if we continue to choose each other again and again, then we will continue to be a community. We will continue to love both God and each other with the same persistence that God continues to love, to choose, and to claim us. And now I would like to invite you to sing with us as we continue to worship the living God. There is none 
Hello, I'm Jan Bonsetville, and this is my husband, John, and we're members of People's United Methodist Church. One of the practices that is important to our faith life is the act of confessing and receiving forgiveness, not just as individuals, but as a community. During the season of Lent, our worship service will include a call to confession, prayer of confession, and words of forgiveness as we focus on this practice as a community of faith. Please hear this call to confession. Science tells us that a person makes about 35,000 choices a day. 35,000 choices each and every day. In the prayer of confession, we pause to take a moment to think and to ask. How many of our decisions are choices God would have us make? How many are not? So let us pray together, knowing that we need guidance and trusting that even if we fall, God is showing us the way. God of justice, we are guilty of building tables. We have built tables that oppression dines on, sexism thrives on, and racism lives on. God of justice, we are guilty of forgetting where we are. Of turning faith into a negotiation tool in the church, into a place for insiders. God of justice, we are guilty of ignoring the point. For you taught that the temple was for worship and your message was for all. God of our hearts, be in our decision-making. Draw near to our choices. Forgive our mistakes. And as you do, flip every table, habit, belief, or point of view that needs adjusting. With hope, we pray for a better day. Amen. And now, hear these words of forgiveness. Family of faith, the good news is that God took on flesh and walked this earth to show us the way. God took on flesh so that we could see what it looks like to disrupt and overturn systems of corruption. God took on flesh to teach us another way. God took on flesh to point us to restoration. God took on flesh so that we might be forgiven. Friends, we are held, loved, and forgiven by a just and merciful God. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. And thank you, John and Jan, for that prayer. Well, good morning again, and a special hello to any kids who may be watching. Um, so the Bible story that we were, we're reading today, uh, it has a, a part of, parts of it that are kind of interesting. So in this story, Jesus comes into the temple, which for the people around him was a lot like this church. And when he gets there, he sees people doing business, but a certain kind of business. You see, in that culture... And the religion that God's people practiced before Jesus came and showed us a different way, the way to be in relationship with God was through sacrifices. Usually that meant that you would take a certain kind of animal. Uh, often it was a sheep or a dove or something similar. And you would kill it and you would cook it in this special place in the temple. And by sacrificing to the animal, that was how you told God that you were sorry for your sins. And because of that sacrifice, then God would forgive you. Well, Jesus sees this happening, sees people buying animals to be sacrificed, and he kind of freaks out. 
he goes to the tables where people are selling the animals and he grabs them and he just flips them over. Which, you know, just think of all the money flying all over the place. And Jesus starts to yell at the, these businessmen. He calls them thieves. It's kind of weird to think of Jesus being angry, right? Because we're told that it's always wrong to be angry. Um, and I might get in trouble for telling you this, but I don't know that that's always necessarily the case. I don't know that it's always wrong to, to get angry. See, the reason why Jesus got angry, the reason why Jesus was so upset was that these businessmen, they were charging way more for these sacrificial animals than they should have been. It's like if you, if you went to Culver's and you got your meal with the cheeseburger that comes with fries or maybe some cheese curds, maybe I'm hungry, and a drink, that should cost what, like $8? But what if one day they decided to charge like $80 for it? Eight zero. That would be pretty messed up, right? And to make matters worse, these people, they needed to buy these animals to keep having a relationship with God. And a lot of them, they didn't have very much money. And so what these businessmen were doing were they were taking advantage of the people's need to be closer to God to just take everything that they had. And so Jesus, as God's son, well, he takes it a little personal. I think that there are a lot of things that go on in the world that are kind of worth getting upset about. I don't know that it's wrong to get upset whenever you hear about how black people were treated during slavery or even how black people are treated today a lot of times. It makes me very upset when I think about the way in which George Taylor, or George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, rather, uh, the way that they were murdered. It makes me upset. It makes me upset to think about the way that girls and women are treated a lot of times when people treat them as though the only thing that matters about them is how they look. And when they don't get the credit that they deserve for their accomplishments. It makes me angry to think about how some kids, they aren't able to get clothes or food or even have a warm home to sleep in at night because of the situation they were born in. Getting mad about things like these, about people being mistreated, I think it's pretty understandable. And while I wouldn't recommend flipping over at tables because we're upset, I think there's a lot of ways in which we can take that anger and do something constructive with it. Um, there's a house by where I live that I walk by all the time and taped up in the, in the windows of that house are signs that the, the kids who live there, that they made, that uh, say Black Lives Matter, which is a, a small way to support people who have been told that, you know, their lives don't matter. I read about a kid who, who started a lemonade stand. And instead of keeping all the money for themselves, they donated it to other kids who weren't born with everything they were, who, you know, didn't have the money to buy shoes so that those, those kids could buy the things that they needed. So maybe this week, you could talk with your parents about some of the things that can make you upset, like when other people are mistreated. And with your parents, you can maybe figure out uh, things that, that you can do that, that you can do that with that anger that might make those situations a little better. Would you please pray with me? Dear God, I pray that you would be with anyone who's being mistreated because of who they are, where they were born, or what they look like. And I pray that you would be with us when we think about those people, even if their situations make us a little angry. I pray that you would help us to take that anger and to use it to do something useful, to do something to help others. 
In your son's name we pray. Amen. The site of the Jewish temple was a place of competing loyalties during Jesus' time, as it is today. The writer of the Gospel of John places the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of his Gospel, whereas it is near the end of the other Gospels, to emphasize the significance of Jesus' signs and wonders. From the Gospel of John, chapter 2, Verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that He had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God. Well, good morning, my friends, and thank you, Jan and John, for reading our scripture for us. My name is Jason Mankey, and I'm one of the pastors here at People's Church, and I'm so thankful to be worshiping with you this day as we continue our walk through the season of Lent, continuing our sermon series again and again. And of course, if you've missed any of the messages in our sermon series, you can um, view past worship services and past messages on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Did you know that this weekend marks the one-year anniversary of the last time we worshipped together in person as a community of faith? I mean, I can hardly believe it. Everything has changed, of course, but I think one of the most dramatic changes that we have experienced in our lives is how we worship Just a year ago, I don't know about you, but I took for granted gathering as a community, shaking hands and embracing people, singing together, eating and drinking with one another, not just the elements of Holy Communion, not just bread, wine, and grape juice, but coffee and treats that we'd eat and drink together, laughing and sharing our lives. All of a sudden... Oof. We're still on this long journey to get back, aren't we? We don't know exactly what things will look like, but one thing I know is so many people are looking forward to getting back here in this building with one another. The church building, whether it's a beautiful suburban church building like this one, or a magnificent cathedral, or a storefront church, is what we tend to associate with many of the feelings that we have about God and our faith. Love, acceptance, community, God's presence, caring, justice, purpose, mission, 
all wrapped up in this building. I know a lot of people expressed to me um, last summer how grateful they were when I moved from leading worship from my home study to here in this room because this room is the place where we mere humans feel like we can go and meet God. I know that is one reason why some people have really struggled spiritually during this pandemic. We attempt to be with God at home, reading devotional literature and attending virtual worship, and all of that is fine as far as it goes, but we, we want more. Today's gospel reading which John and Jan read for us, is one of the most memorable, uh, is one of Jesus' most memorable visits to Herod's great temple in Jerusalem. The temple was a place of worship as far as Israel was concerned. It was the place. No place was more sacred than the temple. The temple was where God and God's people came together. Forgiveness couldn't be attained except through the rituals of the temple. There, sacrifices were made and animals were offered as atonement for the sins of the people. In the temple, the priest wore vestments that were prescribed by the temple codes in the book of Leviticus. And there, the priest dared to enter the solemn holy of holies, the innermost sanctuary of the temple. There the priests conducted business between the people and God in the highest heaven. It's into this temple that Jesus strides, makes a whip, and drives the money changers out. The presence of the money changers back then was seen as a practical necessity, by the way. The Jewish pilgrims who came from came on foot from all over the Mediterranean to that temple. Well, they needed the money changers' service. The money changers would change the Roman currency of these Jewish people that had Caesar's idolatrous image on it into more acceptable coinage for temple transactions. Sacrificial animals were needed for the temple rituals, and the money changers helped make that happen. The money changers were perfectly legal, and by most of the people of the time were seen as absolutely essential to carry on the business of the temple, helping humanity make contact with God. And Jesus, Jesus drives these money changers from the temple. When the officials of the temple ask Jesus to give them a sign of his authorization to interrupt them and these temple proceedings, Jesus says something, well, he says something strange. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What an odd thing to say. Destroy this huge, beautiful center of national pride that has taken decades to build, and I will raise it up again? Well, fortunately, the gospel writer John adds an explanatory comment. The writer of the fourth gospel says that Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. Jesus' body is then the new temple, the new place of worship, the new connection between God and humanity. Destroy that temple on a cross, and God will restore it in three days at the resurrection. Now, the other Gospels, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, say that Jesus had this confrontation with the priests and the money changers at the end of his life, just before his crucifixion. Jesus challenges the religious and political powers that be, and this is the last straw. And so they put him to death. And in his death and resurrection, the veil in the temple, which 
symbolically separates humanity and God is torn in two, connecting us to God in a whole new way through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But John, John puts the cleansing of the temple at the very beginning of his gospel, right up front in chapter 2. Jesus starts his ministry out by striding into the temple and overturning the transactional nature of the relationship between humanity and God, saying in effect, I'm ending the temple way of, connecting to, uh, of God connecting to humanity. Now I'm the new temple. I'm the way that God gets to you and you get to God. Now you don't go into a building. You don't go sacrifice a dove or a lamb at the altar in order to get God's attention. Now you don't go into a grand building to do business with God. Now you do it with me, the new temple. Friends, let me ask you, why do you want to come back here to this building for worship? I mean, I know we miss, I miss, I really miss seeing each and every one of you each week. Friends, I miss singing with you. I miss praying in person with you. I miss hearing your stories and seeing you honestly connect with one another, laughing, sharing stories, crying, caring for one another, supporting one another. And I've heard in my conversations with many of you that you feel the same way. But do you notice anything missing in all of that? Yep, God. There are many things that I want to go back to the way they used to be, as we sometimes say. But one of the things that I hope doesn't go back, even when we're able to gather as a congregation in this building for worship and whatever that looks like, is lifted up by today's scripture lesson. And that is our habit to confine our relationship with God, to confine our faith, to confine our discipleship to the few hours we spend in this building. God is not in a building, even a building as beloved as ours. We don't have to buy our way into God's good favor by buying a lamb or a dove from the money changers. You just have to let yourself be loved by this Jew from Nazareth who looks just like us. And friends, I truly believe that soon we'll be able to gather here in this building once again. First in small groups and then larger and larger groups as people are vaccinated one by one. And you know what? I'm super excited for that time. I long for it more than I, can, more than I can describe. For the community, for the joy, for the difference we are able to continue making together in Oregon and the world. But the truth is, you don't have to journey here to this building or to the temple at Jerusalem or to Rome because God Almighty has journeyed to you right here, right now, as Jesus Christ. Come to this temple, to this Jesus, again and again, who, wonder of wonders, has come to you and who has given you a purpose that far exceeds these walls as well. Amen. Let us sing together.
And now would you please join me in our prayers of the people. And as a reminder, if you have any joys or concerns, you can email either Jason or myself uh, at jason at peoplesumc.org or justin at peoplesumc.org. Or you can also email our office at office at peoplesumc.org. Or you can put them in the comments down below. I'd also like to invite you to help us populate our prayer wall. Uh, during this Lenten season, we're using these banners behind me to create a bit of a prayer wall. As you can see, uh, there's already some prayer requests up there, um, little colorful splotches. Uh, so uh, you can either mail your prayer request to the church or you can email us and we'll print out your prayer request for you and we'll put them up there. Um, ideas for themes in your prayers include petition, thanksgiving, lament, confession, intercession, or adoration, or really anything that you want to tell God. Our hope is that by the time that Easter rolls around, we'll have gotten so many prayers that we won't be able to see the banners anymore. I mean, they're very good looking banners, um, but we'll, we want so many prayer requests that it just covers them up. So again, those email addresses are jason at peoplesumc.org, justin at peoplesumc.org, or office at peoplesumc.org. Now, would you please pray with me? God, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship you. Thank you that the weather is turning, that it seems as though spring has sprung. We thank you for the yearly reminder of life beginning anew. We pray that you would continue to be with those who have lost their jobs in this past year or who are continuing to experience economic uncertainty. We pray that you would remember them and that their fortunes would change soon. We pray these things as your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey, everybody, it's Ann Meyer. Well, we're here. Today is the deadline for submitting vocal tracks for the pre-recorded virtual choir Hallelujah Chorus presentation on Easter morning. If you're having trouble meeting this deadline, please reach out to me. Email Ann, A-N-N-E, -N -N -E, at peoplesumc.org. Hi, I'm Macy, and these are today's announcements. Palm Sunday is coming up in just a couple of weeks, and if you want to have palms for Palm Sunday, you can pick them up at the church on Saturday, March 20th from 10 to 12, and Sunday, March 21st from 11 to 1. All pickups will be drive through The Servant Leadership Board just approved an updated People's Church COVID Safety Plan. As part of that plan, there are guidelines for in-person, small and medium-sized group meetings, both inside and out. You can find a copy of the plan on the church's website, peoplesumc.org. To find out more what's going on at the church, visit peoplesumc.org slash what's happening. And now it is time for us to take a moment to remember that one of the ways in which we put our faith into action is by giving our tithes and offerings. And as a reminder, you can give your tithes and offerings either by going to our church's website, peoplesumc.org, or by using our smartphone app. Or if you'd rather, you can mail a physical check to the church, whichever you're more comfortable with. 
And today for our ministry celebration, we are lifting up our youth group. Throughout the pandemic, the youth group has continued to be able to meet on Zoom and fellowship with each other, to be a support system for each other during this difficult time. And as an outgrowth of that, we've been able to have some of our youth read Lenten poems for the last couple of weeks, and they'll continue to do so throughout the Lenten season. And I've heard from a couple people already that those recorded recordings have been greatly appreciated. And one of the cool things about this Lent specifically is that because our worship service is virtual, we've been able to have young people in the church who have moved away from Oregon, who have already gone off to college, participate in some of those reason, readings. And I've heard that, that y'all appreciate being able to see them and get a sense of how they've been doing as well. Uh, the way in which we're able to make both of these things happen is using our church's Zoom account, which is one of the things that your tithes and offerings have gone towards. So again, we thank you for your generosity. Praise God throughout these passionate days. Praise Christ our Lord whom God did raise. And praise the Spirit. Please pray with me this prayer of thanksgiving. Our Lord, our God, we want for you to show us the way to love only you, not worshiping the things of this world, to love our neighbor freely, not desiring for ourselves something they possess. Accept these offerings, we pray, and teach us again and again to be generous giving fully of ourselves that we may truly be the body of Christ in this world. Amen. Well, friends, this morning we are celebrating Holy Communion. And if you don't have some already, I'd like to invite you to get some bread or a cracker or a bun or a biscuit. Um, and some wine or juice or water um, to celebrate communion virtually um, with Justin and I and, and the people worshiping together. Uh, because here in the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion, which means the love, uh, love and grace of Jesus Christ welcomes all to the table. You need not be a member of this church or any church. The love of Christ is your invitation. So on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks for it, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, Jesus Christ, gracious God, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Loving God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered together and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one uh, with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 
Amen. Friends, this is the bread of life which is broken for you. And this is the cup of salvation poured out for you. I invite you to take, eat, drink. Thank you for offering yourself up for our sins. And thank you for giving us this reminder in the bread and the cup of what you've done for us. I pray that as we move about our weeks, that you would uh, give us a daily reminder of how much you love us and that we would in turn seek to do your will in our daily lives. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sing to the ancient. 
Receive this blessing. May God shine upon you. Christ fill you with true wisdom and strength. And the Holy Spirit guide you into all faithfulness now and forever. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of your day, friends.